welcome to my channel critical care basics and uh, I'm sorry that uh, due to some personal mishap in my family this video is coming late uh, we are discussing ECG tutorials in this uh, channel and we were in last video we were discussing about atrial fibrillation so that was the part one of atrial fibrillation in part two and three we will discuss about certain clinical features and management of AF in part 2 regarding stroke prevention and in part 3 regarding the rate and rhythm control. So uh, even if this is not just related to ECG but we are going to discuss about AF because AF has a lot of clinical implication and causes a lot of clinical burden. So let us start about clinical features and the burden of AF. AF patients have 1.5 to 3.5 times more chance of dying. So this could be due to heart failure or other comorbidities or stroke. They have uh, 20 to 30 percent of all patients who have stroke could have atrial fibrillation and even 10 percent of cryptogenic stroke. Cryptogenic strokes mean all those patients who have stroke but the cause is not known they could be having 10% of those could be having AF and it could be cardioembolic or atheroma related. LV dysfunction or heart failure, 20 to 30% of AF patients will have heart failure. It could be due to fast ventricular rate or irregular ventricular contractions. Many patients of AF will have cognitive decline, even dementia. So the reason could be brain small lacunar infarcts, white matter lesions or hypoperfusion or even microembolism. Importantly 16 to 20 percent of patients with AF will have depression. So depression could be due to severe symptoms or decreased quality of life or drug side effects. More than 60 percent of patients with AF will have impaired quality of life. This could be due to AF burden or comorbidities or psychological dysfunction or medication. Lastly, 10 to 40 percent of AF patient will get hospitalized annually. This could be due to AF management related or due to fast ventricular rate, heart failure, MI, AF related symptoms or treatment complications. So there is a lot of adverse outcomes which are associated with AF. That is why I have decided to talk in more detail about AF to spread more awareness amongst the doctors as well as the staff because as acute care physicians and nurses we have to be more aware of all the problems that AF can cause. The clinical symptoms AF could be asymptomatic we will talk about it in subclinical AF. The most common symptoms are palpitations, dyspnea, chest tightness, dizziness, syncope or poor exercise tolerance. If the patients are hemodynamically unstable, they could have syncope, symptomatic hypotension, heart failure, pulmonary edema, ongoing myocardial ischemia or even cardiogenic shock. Subclinical AF. This is a condition when the patient does not know AF, does not know that he she has AF. Patient does not have a prior diagnosis of AF and AF is detected by some implantable or wearable cardiac monitor or even smart watch or a mobile app. So it occurs without symptoms and without a prior diagnosis. Most of these individuals will have a paroxysmal AF, means AF will come suddenly and go suddenly. Importantly, most of these patients will eventually progress to clinical AF and it is often detected when the patient presents with heart failure. And last but not the least, this is associated with increased risk of stroke. So these are the various uh, devices which could detect a subclinical AF. For example, patient goes to a, a doctor for a BP checkup or a patient could have some uh, app in his mobile or wearable watch or Holter monitoring. So varied devices. Importantly, there are two important uh, devices that are most commonly used nowadays, nowadays mobile apps and watches. 
तो द सेंसिटिविटी ऑफ मोबाइल ऐप पिकिंग अप ए एफ सब क्लिनिकल एफ इज नाइन्टी वन टू नाइन्टी एट परसेंट एंड स्पेसिफिसिटी इज ऑल्सो नाइन्टी वन टू हंड्रेड परसेंट द वॉचेस हैव अ सेंसिटिविटी हायर नाइन्टी सेवन टू नाइन्टी नाइन परसेंट बट स्पेसिफिसिटी इज स्लाइटली लो एटी थ्री टू नाइन्टी फोर परसेंट सो दिस डिवाइस इवेंचुअली हेल्प टू पिक अप द ए एफ कमिंग टू द फिजिकल एग्जामिनेशन इन ए एफ द मोस्ट स्ट्राइकिंग थिंग दैट यू नोटिस इज इेगुलरली इेगुलर पल्स hence any patient with irregular pulse on admission to icu or to emergency room think about af get a ecg done immediately second thing is apical radial pulse deficit what is apical pulse radial deficit if you keep a stethoscope on heart and count the heart rate and at the same time you keep a hand on the pulse and count the pulse rate there will be difference for example here not all the beats or not all the impulses which travel to the ventricle are strong enough to create a stroke volume sufficient to cause a pulse for example here you can see irregular irregular rhythm the top strip showing the ecg same patient the arterial pulse so by uh, by the by this ecg the heart rate is around more than 150 but see here If you calculate heart rate, it will come one, two, three, four, five. It is about sixty, less than sixty. So this is called apical radial pulse deficit. The jugular A waves are absent. Normally, jugular pulse shows three waves, A, C, and V, three positive waves, and this A wave is absent in patients with atrial fibrillation. There will be slight variation in intensity of S one, S four. S4 is due to atrial contraction it will not be heard whenever you see a patient of AF C4 any valvular heart disease especially MS if the patient has MS whenever the you see a patient of MS you get a uh, typical murmur mid diastolic murmur with pre systolic accentuation that pre systolic accentuation is due to atrial contraction and it will be lost in patient with AF so as soon as a patient with MS develops AF this pre systolic accentuation would be absent and you will have to take blood pressure many times because there will be beat to beat variation in the stroke volume this is the european heart rhythm association ehra symptom scale for af this is important because if the patient is young and patient has more symptoms he could be a candidate for ablation so if there is no symptoms then the patient has a score of 1 if the patient has mild to moderate symptom in which the normal daily activity is not affected then the patient comes in score 2 to a and b when the symptoms are severe but normal daily activity is affected and the 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 score is 3 and when normal daily activity is discontinued the score is 4 so this is disabling whenever a patient of af comes always get a baseline ecg because in ecg you could see markers of non electrical cardiac disease such as left ventricular hypertrophy which could point to a hypertension or q wave suggestive of old myocardial infarction also markers of electrical heart disease like presence of pre excitation if the patient has pre excitation you would uh, like to avoid drugs which slow the av conduction and presence of bundle branch blocks the qt interval to identify potential risk of antiarrhythmic therapy because many drugs antiarrhythmic drugs increase the qt interval and there is a risk of torsart lastly there is evidence of severe bradycardia you have to rule out sinus node dysfunction the work up in af all patients with af you have to take proper medical history look for af related symptom ehra score look for concomitant conditions like mi heart failure look for chat 2 ds vas score will come to it get a proper 12 ed ecg get a thyroid profile because hyperthyroidism is one of the risk factors for developing af get a kidney function and liver function test because many drugs uh, will have to uh, you will have to adjust the dose in kidney function kidney dysfunction 
get electrolytes and full blood count and get a trans thoracic echocardiography in select patients you may require ambulatory ecg monitoring if there is a doubt that patient has paroxysmal af if you think that there is there could be a la clot then get a trans esophageal echocardiography if you think there is myocardial ischemia tropi if you think patient has heart failure bnp you may also require to do coronary ct angio ischemia imaging even in if you suspect a ti or a stroke get brain imaging or mri then the patient should have a structured follow up you have to ensure that the patient uh, gets optimal care the cardiologist or af specialist sees the patient or the patient is seen by a specially trained nurse we'll come to it in next slide in addition to primary care physicians he should be seen by a cardiologist and preferably a nurse who is trained to treat af patients treatment of uh, af in addition to primary care physician you may have to involve a dietitian if the patient is diabetic or patient is obese or patient has dyslipidemia or hypertension you may require the services of endocrine specialist if the patient has hyperthyroidism or pheochromocytoma patient may require the help of psychologist if uh, he or she has depression there is important role of pharmacist because there are so many drugs which are given for rate and rhythm control and also anticoagulant and the dose and the drug need to be modified accordingly if the patient has obstructive sleep apnea a sleep physician may also be involved lastly exercise physiologist will decide what amount of physical activity is allowed to the patient coordinating these will be the af specialist nurse and a cardiologist if required electrophysiologist if the patient has uh, very high symptoms and he is a candidate for ablation so the patient has to be treated and decisions have to be made as per the guidelines so somebody has to ensure whether all the guidelines are being adhered to this is the abc pathway for integrated management of patients with atrial fibrillation a stands for avoid stroke optimize stroke prevention b stands for better symptom management treat symptoms in this comes the rate and rhythm control c stands for cardiovascular and other morbidities and management of risk factors for example management of hypertension heart disease management of heart failure diabetes lifestyle changes all comes in c in the following few slides i have restricted myself to a stroke prevention right so in stroke prevention step 1 is to identify low risk patients low risk patients are those patients who do not require oral anticoagulation step 2 offer stroke prevention in form of oral anticoagulants to all those patients who have one or more risk factors and assess the bleeding risk and step 3 decide on which oic to be started and put the patient on oic this slide uh, we have already discussed in my lecture of atrial flutter but for those who have not seen that lecture uh, this is a chat 2 ds fast score is used this is a mnemonic every letter stands for a condition and every condition gets a point right so this is this helps us to uh, decide who requires oral anticoagulation c stands for heart failure H stands for hypertension both getting one one points age more than 75 gets two points because as the age rises the incidence of af rises stroke initial stroke gets two points matlab the stroke happening before the patient is diagnosed gets two points any vascular disease one point age 65 to 74 one point 75 above 75 two points 65 to 74 one point and female one point right so as per the aha guidelines any score more than 2 for males and more than 3 for females you have to recommend anticoagulation for example if the score is 0 in male and 1 in female the risk is low so no anticoagulation therapy is required if the score is 1 in male 
then oral anticoagulation may be considered the indication is class 2a if the score is 2 or more then anticoagulation is recommended the recommend, recommend, uh, recommendation is class 1a so 2 onwards you have to definitely anticoagulate before starting anticoagulation you have to assess the risk for bleeding so that has bled score again h stands for hypertension a stands for abnormal renal and or liver function each getting one point previous stroke stands for one point bleeding one point any bleeding except menses Levi INR more than 1.4 gets one point elderly more than 65 years there it was more than 75 here it is 65 years get one point and any drug including antiplatelets and alcohol one point for each as you can see from this chart as the risk of uh, as the score goes above three the risk of bleeding almost goes more than four patients per year bleeds 100 patient years so about three usually the oral anticoagulants are avoided or the risk factors are modified so this is the flow chart if the patient with atrial fibrillation eligible for oral anticoagulation first see whether the patient has any prosthetic mechanical wall or valvular severe mitral stenosis if yes then that patient gets vitamin k antagonist if the patient does not have a prosthetic uh, wall or a severe mitral stenosis then calculate the chat 2ds fast score right if the score is uh, zero in males and one in females the patient is in low risk so no antithrombotic uh, therapy is required step two if the score is say uh, more than two and calculate the has blood risk if the has blood risk is uh, score is more than three then don't hold the patient on anticoagulant first try to improve the factors for example in has blood there is hypertension so control the hypertension so if by controlling the risk factors you can reduce the has blood score then still give these patients a chance on oral anticoagulation to prevent stroke if the uh, chat 2 ds fast score is one in male or two in female then you could consider class 2a indication but if the score is more than two in male and more than three in females there is a class 1 indication for starting oral anticoagulant drugs now uh, some brief discussion on the uh, oral anticoagulant drugs which are now used because many of the doctors or the staff members in the ICU will receive the patient who are using one of these drugs right so there are in the newer oral anticoagulant drugs there are four drugs which are predominantly used now Debigatron Rivaroxaban, Apixaban and Edoxaban. The mechanism Dabigatron is a direct thrombin antagonist while all the rest of the three are direct factor 10A antagonist. PGP is enzyme. So all of these drugs are PGP substrates. So if there is a PGP inducer drug, for example, many of the antiviral drugs are PGP inducers so they will reduce the uh, they will reduce the level of these drugs similarly CYP3A4 this is a liver enzyme which metabolizes some of these drugs most of these drugs so except for dabigatran all of the drugs are substrate to this enzyme especially rivaroxaban and apixaban Metabolism of dabigatran is glucuronic acid co conjugation while the rest of the three are metabolized by liver enzymes like CYP3A4 and CYP2C8 etc. Bioavailability 3 to 7 percent this is a pro drug basically 66 percent with food rivaroxaban and 80 percent without food. So any patient getting rivaroxaban should not take it with food. 50% bioavailability with apixaban and 62% with edoxaban. Liver uh, pro drug, so this is the only pro drug. Rest of the all the three drugs are active drugs. What is the meaning of pro drug? This is not a drug active drug. It goes and is metabolized and then it becomes active. So that is called a pro drug. So dabigatran is a pro drug. All of the rest of the drugs are 
एक्टिव ड्रग्स लिवर मेटाबोलिज्म बाय सी वाई पी थ्री ए फोर डेबेगाट्रॉन इज नॉट अफेक्टेड ऑल द रेस्ट ऑफ द ड्रग्स स्पेशली लिवर ऑक्सीबैन एंड एपेक्सबैन आर मेटाबोलाइज बाय दिस एंजाइम सो इन लिवर फेलियर यू हैव टू रिड्यूस द डोज और अवॉइड यूजिंग दीज ड्रग्स द डोज ऑफ डेबेगाट्रॉन इज वन फिफ्टी मिलीग्राम बी डी और इफ द एज इज मोर देन सेवेंटी फाइव ईयर्स यू हैव टू रिड्यूस द ड्रग डोज टू हंड्रेड टेन मिलीग्राम बी डी रिवर ऑक्सीबैन ट्वेंटी मिलीग्राम ओडी वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट डोजेस इन ए एफ राइट फॉर स्ट्रोक प्रिवेंशन एपिकसगवैन द डोज इज टू पॉइंट फाइव टू फाइव मिलीग्राम बी डी इफ द एज इज मोर देन एट ईयर्स और द वेट ऑफ द पेशेंट इज लेस देन सिक्सटी के जी देन टू पॉइंट फाइव मिलीग्राम बी डी अदरवाइज फाइव मिलीग्राम बी डी एडोक्सवैन सिक्सटी मिलीग्राम ओडी द एंटीडोट इडारोसिजुमैम और थ्री और फोर फैक्टर प्रोथ्रामिन कॉम्प्लेक्स कॉन्सेंट्रेट हियर एड एन एक्सर्ट एल्फा फॉर ऑल द अदर थ्री ड्रग्स एक्सेप्ट फॉर डेबिगेट रन ऑल द अदर थ्री ड्रग्स एड एन एक्सर्ट एल्फा एंड एरिपेजिन एंड प्रोथ्रामिन कॉम्प्लेक्स कॉन्सेंट्रेट दिस इज अ शॉर्ट गाइड ऑन यूजिंग दीज ड्रग्स इन लिवर फेल्यूर एंड किडनी फेल्यूर फॉर एग्जाम्पल up to gfr 50 all of these drugs can be used in their normal doses when the gfr drops to less than 50 you have to reduce the dose of dabigatron to 110 mg bd but there is high risk of bleeding you have to reduce the dose of rivaroxaban to 15 mg od and preferably apixaban also 2.5 mg bd reduce the dose of adoxaban edoxaban to 30 mg od when the gfr is less than 30 do not use dabigatron you can use the rest of the drugs in the reduced doses with caution and when the patient is on dialysis none of these newer oral anticoagulants can be used in liver problems if the patient has liver failure child poke category a then no dose reduction is required if uh, the patient is child poke category b then you can use dabigatron with caution but do not use rivaroxaban use apixaban and edoxaban with caution and in category c none of these drugs can be used so severe renal failure and liver failure you cannot use these drugs this is the uh, result in different coagulation tests that you will see when the patient is on these drugs for example in prothrombin and inr patient on dabigatron will have some rise but patient with rivaroxaban will have significant rise in uh, inr some rise in apixaban or doxaban aptt dabigatron will show significant rise in aptt some rise in rivaroxaban apixaban or doxaban act will have some increase in most of these drugs and thrombin time because dabigatron acts a direct thrombin antagonist so thrombin time will significantly increase with dabigatron but will not increase with the rest of the drugs lastly all those patients with renal failure you can use only one anticoagulant that is vitamin k antagonist and all those patient with prosthetic mechanical valves and severe mitral stenosis again you have to use these drugs so here you can use warfarin or acitrom the dose of warfarin is 5 mg od to begin with acitrom 2 mg od to begin with and then adjust as per the inr target is vitamin k dependent factors factor 2 7 9 and 10 the half life is is 12 to 14 hours renal clearance is zero so these can be given in renal failure onset of action is 3 to 5 hours anticoagulation monitoring these drugs require monitoring and you have to keep the inr continuously between 2 to 3 most of the time interactions are multiple so whenever using warfarin uh, always see for different drug interactions no dose adjustment required in kidney function alteration kidney failure but if the liver function is altered you have to closely monitor the inr amiodarone is one of the drugs which is frequently given in patient with atrial fibrillation so amiodarone may increase the serum level hence you have to decrease the dose of warfarin by 20 to 30% 20 30 to 50% 
during initiation it requires bridging it takes time to act so if you start the drug today it will take about three to five days for the INR to come to the therapeutic range of three, uh, two to three. So till that time, if the patient requires anticoagulation, then you could give bridging therapy with heparin or low molecular, heparin, low molecular weight heparin. And this requires annual time in therapeutic range, TTR, of at least 70% means most of the time 70 percent of the time the patient should be in therapeutic range of INR 2 to 3 percent for this to be effective otherwise if the patient does not land in that many uh, patients taking warfarin do not get an INR done and they do not whenever they do an INR once in six months they are not in this therapeutic range at all so they are not being protected this is the drug of choice in patient with volvular heart disease and mechanical prosthetic valves. So these are the situations where vitamin K antagonist could be preferable to direct acting oral anticoagulants. Patient with mechanical heart wall of any type or location. Patient with severe MS with mitral wall area of less than 1.5 square centimeters. Patient with in whom the direct oral anticoagulants are to be avoided due to drug interactions. For example, patient on PGP inducers. Most of the antiviral drugs are PGP inducers. For those patients, you may not be able to use these drugs. Patient with renal failure, all those patients with creatinine clearance less than 30, it is best to avoid oral, uh, direct acting oral anticoagulant drugs. These drugs are costly, the newer oral anticoagulant drugs. Uh, warfarin is cheap, time tested. And there are certain patients who want to take only one tablet a day. For them, warfarin, acetrom, or adoxaban, only three choices. <clears throat> Again, this is important to maintain a TTR, time in therapeutic range of more than 70%. All patients should have an INR measured before starting therapy. If the patient has no intracardiac thrombus, or no history of prior thromboembolism, you can directly start this warfarin on OPD basis. But if the patient has high risk of thrombolism prior TIA or the patient has a LA thrombus, then you have to give heparin bridging regimen like we discussed just now. Because warfarin takes 3 to 5 days for the INR to rise between 2 to 3. For that much time, the heparin or low molecular heparin will act and after 24 hours of INR reaching the therapeutic range of between 2 to 3, you can discontinue heparin and continue warfarin. Thank you for watching. This was about the stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. In next class, next lecture, we'll talk about the rate and rhythm control in AF. Thanks a lot. If you're liking these videos, please share, subscribe and like.